asked by the Milton Foundation to do these short lectures. Um, they were meant to be 20 minutes, by the way, but they each, each turned out to be nearer 40 minutes in the end, and so I apologize for that. But it, it was partly because I, I found myself getting, getting into the act of, uh, of, of um, giving an account of the ethics of aid and the objections and the nature of development. These are things I, I love lecturing on at greater length. And so I just tried to give you, in a very informal way, a feel for what the ethical issues are, at least as I see it, uh, surrounding aid, the positive arguments, the difficulties, and some account of the nature of development that we have in the back of our minds, as it were. But I just thought I'd start this discussion um, by just making one or two comments that uh, occurred to me um, looking at the, uh, the exchange of emails that's been taking place amongst the deep divers, um, uh, partly in response to my lectures, partly I think just generally thinking about what it's going to be like in Haiti. Um, and I, there were just a couple of general things I wanted to, to comment on. Uh, first of all, um, I think some of you picked up that the whole issue of aid is a, a complicated one because it's, it moves between two poles. On the one hand, uh, there's the, uh, the pole of the, the, the position of the individual, what should the individual do, um, and then there's the question of what should happen in terms of changes of institution, political change, and so on and so forth. Um, and so um, the issue of the ethics of what individuals should do um, is one thing. The ethics of what states or organizations should do is a slightly different but connected question. Um, and I think, I think one of you said in the um, exchange of emails, that, you know, we need to have both levels. Um, we need institutional change, but we need to do personal things as well. And of course, one of the personal things we can do is actually engage in, in political activism. But of course, a lot of people don't do that. They simply prefer to either give services you're doing in Haiti or support charities who are doing service and so on. Um, but one of the reasons I, w I wanted to pick up on the uh, kind of personal uh, political, as it were, um, is that what did, I think, feature a lot of discussions um, was the whole question of what the motives are for giving aid. Um, I think a number of you uh, recognize that, for instance, you're going to Haiti. It, it isn't just about you wanting to do a bit of good in some appropriate way, but because you think you'll have a, a good time, a bit of a holiday, um, make friends, and, and so on and so forth. But at, at, at another level, um, one or two of you worried about the whole issue of why do governments give aid? Um, and um, obviously, to some extent, governments are giving aid because they want to curry favor with the uh, countries they're, they're working in, or they, they want a supply of their, their, um, their goods or even their weapons and so on. Um, and so this whole question, whether it's at the personal level or at the political level, of what I call mixed motives, is an absolutely central one in thinking about the giving of aid. And I suppose I want to put a thought to you, um, and it's like this. I don't think it's realistic to think that when people, either individuals or organizations, give aid, um, we can expect absolutely pure motives. I think this is um, almost too much. What I think we can recognize is that whilst we may have, and individuals may have and governments may have mixed motives. Um, what's important is if we do have these additional motives to do with our own benefit or our own country's benefit, these extra motives don't distort the kind of aid we give. It might be a, back, a, back, a, a motivation in the background, but if, it doesn't, if the aid is still appropriate, uh, whatever the motives, then we shouldn't be too quick to condemn it. If, on the other hand, the aid that is given is clearly shaped by the considerations of, say, national interest or, or whatever, then, then I think we have serious problems on our hands. Uh, so I, I sort of just wanted to sort of explore that, this, this tension, and maybe one or two of you might want to come, come back to that um, in, in discussion. Um, and finally, the, the third thing I wanted to um, point out is it seemed to me some of you were picking up on the whole question of the attitude of the aid giver. In fact, you were worrying about the attitude of yourselves, whether you were going into, uh, into Haiti with a kind of cultural superiority or, or something like that. And I think that is a really interesting question as to what the attitudes are. 
of, of, of those who participate. Um, and we might want to have some discussion of that. Um, and I think it's linked to something one of you mentioned, which is the kind of the importance of a, how we understand participation. Um, because participation can be understood in both a bottom-up and a top-down fashion. If it's top-down, the aid givers may have a view as to what they think is good for the community, and they come in and try and get local people to be persuaded that that's what they ought to do. And so there's a bit of participation and consultation going on. But what I think you recognized several of you was that really genuine participation, or the kind of participation that we want to accept or approve of, is where local people themselves make choices which determine their own future. And the role of the aid giver is a more modest one. This is where attitudes come in. The role of the aid giver is a more modest one in um, facilitating or empowering people, local people, uh, to make their own choices and, and take control of their, their lives and their future. Um, so I, I was just intrigued by those points that were coming through in the email discussion. There may be other things that were in there too, but I hope that's just a, a useful way of getting started, Marcus. Okay, thanks very much for that introduction. Uh, Hello? Um, thanks very much for this introduction. Okay. I, I could hear, we could hear you very well. Um, as you see, I took right. some notes of what you uh, what you just outlined, um, right. and I think it's a it's a great way of uh, picking up also from of, uh, from the uh, discussions that uh, the fellows had among themselves. Um, mm -hmm. So I don't know if we want to start with uh, these impulses or maybe uh, the fellows Ashley Biggs. Christina, Johanna, maybe you have some uh, some questions uh, that came more directly out of the lectures. So who has who wants to start with the first question or comment? It's like a tutorial at home, dead silence. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I had a question. Yes, Johanna. Who, who's that? That's Johanna. Yeah. That's Johanna. Okay. Hello. <laughs> Hi. Um, on your second lecture, you talked uh, about cosmopolitanism. Yeah. And you said, um, you know, there's individualism, universality, and generality, and that, you know, generality the kind of builds on the the other two principles. So if I if I assume that uh, I'm usually concerned for every human being and, and that everyone is equal. I should yep. assume that this you know applies to everyone and everyone should think like that. Now, how does it fit in there that not everyone agrees with the two first principles how I mean how does one deal with that? That's more like a philosophical question though <laughs> Well, I'm a philosopher <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, um, I can certainly comment on that if Marcus would like me to now or you want to wait well, a bit and get some sure. other questions. No, I think we can uh, go question by question. Yeah, so, okay, uh, let me just, um, if I've understood you, Anna, uh, properly, um, you, you notice, and I, I use, I think it's a rather interesting quotation from Thomas Poggy, and by the mm -hmm. way, his book on world poverty and human rights, I think is, is one of the most important books written in recent years on the whole issue of global poverty and our responses to it. I commend the whole book if people want a fairly hard read. It's not easy, but it's very interesting. But anyway, uh, he has this uh, quotation which I, I use with students, or have used, um, about the essence of cosmopolitanism. And I think it's a pretty good definition of what most cosmopolitans would say. It's not absolutely a universal view, I think. But you're quite right. He, he has three key features. Individualism, this individual human being that, that matters. Uh, secondly, uh, the equality principle that all human beings matter equally. Um, and, and the generality idea, which is that somehow it matters to all of us. We all have in, in principle some reason why we might help promote human well-being anywhere and certainly not to impede it. Uh, and um, you're asking the question, well, not everyone accepts uh, the first two um, principles. Um, I mean, obviously, uh, cosmopolitanism 
um, is a theory, or oh, it's actually many theories, there are many versions of it, um, and it, of course someone who says he's a cosmopolitan isn't claiming that everyone else will accept cosmopolitanism, and a lot of people of course do sadly, uh, I think, um, treat other human beings in other countries as less important, almost in principle, um, so less inferior in some way. Um, and there are some people who don't take the status of the individual as seriously as, as they might. Um, the fact that some people don't agree with the view doesn't make, make it, to my mind, unacceptable, because I don't think anyone who puts forward the cosmopolitan view is claiming that everyone believes it. Uh, what he's saying is that everyone should believe it. Um, and if people um, don't accept it, then we have to argue against them if they don't uh, um, do this. I mean, I think in many ways, to me, the bit that sticks in most people's uh, minds is not the other first two, but generality, because most people will not accept that uh, we have significant obligations to care for human beings anywhere in principle. Um, of course, in practice, we can only care for a limited number. There's a limited amount of time, energy, and resource each of us has. Um, but the point is that we, we treat people anywhere in the world as, in principle, worthy of our attention if there are things we can do uh, that we think is a good use of our time, energy, and resources. I don't know whether that's answering your question or whether I've slightly missed the point. Can you um, perhaps comment? Yeah, it's more, um, well, it was pretty much there. It was more like, you know, how do you get people to, to that last stage? Because, I mean, yeah. um, if you take it to the, to the extreme, it's, it's a very radical notion. Um, well, can, can I comment on? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, <laughs> you're, is it a radical notion? Now, one of the things I tried to touch on without going too far into it, because none of these lectures are very deep, um, in the first lecture, before I got a call at cosmopolitanism, um, I, cons I, in discussion of Peter Singer, do you remember? Um, yeah, yeah, that's, I, that's I, why I, where I thought yeah. <laughs> it would be very um, extreme, if you, if you go yeah. to that extreme. If, then if, if you, well, I, I, w I mean, I've had discussions with many students of the Singer article, and, 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 and understandably many would say, well, you know, I just don't accept the principle. But I think, to me, and the more I thought about it over the years, the more I've come to this view that, yes, some cosmopolitans can put forward a very strong thesis, and Peter Singer's thesis is essentially a very strong cosmopolitan thesis. He's saying we ought to help whenever we can as much as we can. And that does put extraordinary demands on our lives. And I don't think that's, that's the point of cosmopolitanism myself. I think the point about cosmopolitanism is more it's about an attitude that I have an openness to the world and I accept that, that in principle all human beings have equal status. I accept the idea of moral human rights, whatever the internet you know, quite apart from the international legal framework, we accept morally the thesis that all human beings have an entitled to the basic conditions of a reasonable, flourishing life. And if we accept that principle of equality, that informs our whole attitude toward people. It, it informs our, our, the way we think about other cultures and whether we tolerate them and welcome diversity of views and worldviews or we're intolerant. So cosmopolitanism seems to me is primarily an attitude that says all human beings matter, therefore there are certain attitudes of respect and, and concern, as it were. It doesn't in itself say, and therefore we must spend all our uh, daylight hours working and slaving to help humanity as much as possible. I don't think that follows from the idea of being a citizen of the world or global citizen. But some cosmopolitan thinkers do want to push a very strong thesis. But um, my view is that so long as we accept a basic attitude on the world, and we accept that we have significant responsibilities towards people everywhere, not just our own society, uh, then, then it seems to me that's the core idea. Does that make much better sense? Yes. Hmm. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I've reassured you. I, I, I'm not trying to um, push a, a really extreme radical view on you. Um, I, 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 mean, I, I didn't go into the issue, but uh, um, I could say a lot more, or could have said a lot more about the issue of how much obligation, and some, as I, as I say, think it's very extreme, um, like Singer, other people take a, a, a different view, but what a cosmopolitan wouldn't say is, well, in practice, we needn't worry about the world then. And the cosmopolitan will say, yeah, I mean, where there are appropriate actions we can take, appropriate forms of support we can give to change in the world, 
that help people in the world generally, we ought to do that. Um, maybe uh, just just a quick observation to that. I think also as we move from uh, what we should do to the one part of Johanna's question was how do we actually persuade others? Oh, I yeah, think we're right. we're moving kind of from the the ethical question to the political question or psychological question or. Oh, Psycho yes. Well, <laughs> Johanna is a psychologist. I mean, <laughs> yeah. Well, the point is, uh, I mean, yeah, Mark has put a gloss on the move from the, the, the pure ethical to the political, but I think it, what you're really moving to it is a broader question about how to affect change. And, of course, one of the ways of affecting change in the direction of what you believe is by political action, but there are all sorts of other things we can do um, through education, for instance, uh, through... Um, the kind of discussions we have with people over coffee and over a beer or wine or whatever. Um, there are opportunities all over the place for uh, attempting to um, get people to um, change their priorities. And I think one of the most important aspects of global um, citizenship is in fact the whole concept of what's called global citizenship education. Um, I don't know if I, I can't remember I mentioned it, but there's a very good article uh, by Martha Nussbaum uh, on called patriotism and cosmopolitanism, um, uh, and it, it, it very much emphasizes the importance of cosmopolitan education. There's a lot of background noise at the moment, Marcus. Um, can you? Uh, <laughs> I didn't. I didn't mute everyone since we're a very oh, small right. group. But uh, well, please okay, keep but please keep your microphones yeah. muted when you're not talking. Don't knock them. <laughs> anyway, I'm sorry. Is that is that? So I think I, I'm just glossing on Marcus's gloss. If I make do that, <laughs> I think uh, the, the, yes, there is a. I've I've actually been very interested in this question. Um, and um, by the way, I I don't know whether you've been told deep divers, but um, I've just posted off some copies of a book I wrote many years ago, called World Poverty Challenge and Response. And one of the things I look at. In, in the last two chapters of that book is the kind of how do we get people to change question. Uh, so I, it is certainly, uh, I think, uh, not enough just to spout the moral principles. There is a question of persuasion, which is partly out of psychology, sociology, and politics. Um, hello. Yep. Yes. Can you hear me well? OK. Um, Who is this? Yeah. Uh, Cristina Martones. Oh, nice. Hello. Yep. Hello. Um, I, see, I think that is very relevant and very interesting to point out uh, Joanne is pointing out about cosmopolitanism and all the discussion that we are taking uh, really remembers me about a philosopher, Honet, um, who in an article called Recognition and Justice, um, he, um, he says that there exist three factors for uh, a deeply recognition of persons and is to um, to feel yourself loved, like ap appreciated by others, yeah. Yeah. Um, to feel equal in law to the others, and so if you're uh, equal. equal in law. Equal in law, yeah, yeah. 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 Um, and the, the third point is to uh, feel able to contribute into society from your own uh, your own cultural background and your own skills to can contribute to participate. And I, I think, think that, mm -hmm. yes? No, I was just going to say, uh, um, I'm very glad you mentioned Axel Honneth. Um, I, I actually met him a few years ago in Paris at a conference on global ethics. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> we, we had quite a, a, a chat uh, in a bar once, uh, which was quite fun. But yes, I, and I'd also met him in Iceland a few years earlier uh, um, when he was comparing Kant and Hegel on the concept of marriage. It was fascinating. <laughs> but anyway, um, no, he's he's a very interesting writer, and I mean, I, he's coming out of a different tradition from my Anglo-Saxon analytic tradition. But on the other hand, he and I found we had a lot in common, and I, I think that summary of of of, of what's involved in um, feeling loved, equality in law, and being able to contribute sums up a lot of the crucial features that we want any human being to feel, um, and because it 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 both. Uh, covers the active side, the kind of active global citizenship, if you like. Um, it ha has a status claim that we're all uh, equal. I would say not just equal in law, but equal in moral status as well, um, which is not quite the same thing. 
um, and as you say, this feeling of being loved or recognized. So um, I, I say uh, yay to all that. I think that's a very nice reminder of, of a, a rich approach. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, yes, and in fact, uh, I am a, a big part of his, uh, oh, right. <laughs> could we call it, uh, theory. Uh, I am using it for a thesis that I am making here in Germany. and. Um, I am uh, I am in the middle of the way, but until now um, it seems that um, the human connectedness that we could have with the other people plays a very relevant role to get these three factors and to be finally recognized in a plural society. Mm -hmm. Of course, it's uh, say getting it formally recognized. I mean, that's a, that is a problem um, within um, countries as well as between countries, uh, because in some many countries uh, not all people do feel they have an equal status. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, so that's a big challenge for, um, if you like, domestic uh, legal, well, domestic political processes and legal change. And of course it's also relevant at the, at, at the global level um, of, 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 of recognition of all people as being equal. Um, and it's a very interesting question as to how far the equality of all human beings, as recognized in, in uh, 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 an active human rights culture, um, how far that equality internationally depends on the equality of, of nations. I think that's a, <laughs> perhaps too big an issue to take too far just here, but it isn't something I talked about in the lecture, but it just comes out in my mind that, that uh, I think a lot of people would say that uh, for people to feel equal status, then they must feel that their countries have equal status. Um, in, um, uh, sorry, I've just noticed my computer is going to run out of juice. Is that, I'm just giving a plug in. Okay. Hello? Yes, we still hear you. Okay. <laughs> you still hear me. Uh, no, I thought I was going to lose power just then. Mm. I thought it was plugged in, but it wasn't. Um, so, uh, it's an interesting question as to how far global equality um, has to be equated with international equality, where international means the equality between nations. Um, and this is then tied up with all questions about people's identity as members of nations and countries, things like that. Mm. Um, uh, and there's a whole dynamic there uh, about um, how global citizenship relates to national identities and so on. But I mean, I do think one of the big challenges is, is is in international human rights law. And one of the things that fascinates me, I just mentioned it in passing, is how I think, I think I once discussed this with Marcus actually in Vienna, how far the, um, um, we're moving in the UN system from um, an understanding of human rights as, as it were rights in international law and how far we're beginning to see them as having more of a cosmopolitan um, backing almost, as Don, um, David Held would call it, cosmopolitan human rights law. Um, insofar as the international community is taking more and more seriously now the idea that the protection and promotion of human rights in any country is an international responsibility. Whereas, to some extent in the past, um, it was left to countries to get on with promoting and protecting their rights of, of citizens. But given the kind of um, the problems we've had of so many countries failing to do so, or even violating people's rights, it's become more and more of an issue in the UN. Hence the thing some of you may have heard called, called responsibility to protect in 2005. But anyway, sorry, that's getting a bit off of course. So I think our chairman should bring us back to the main business. <laughs> <laughs> I think we're uh, we're we're it's all we're on the topic. Uh, of course, everything is interesting. Everything is, uh, but but I think we're we're still square on the topic. And even when you go into that direction, um, I think what uh, what we can see from that development uh, in in the direction of uh, having a more cosmopolitan understanding of human rights instead of uh, the international understanding yeah. um, that. While it's, uh, I would totally agree that it's a, it's a, um, it's a good development and one that we should applaud and, and bring help bring forward. At the same time, we see um, it also has some unintended consequences um, mm -hmm. 
how do you protect uh, human rights in a con in in a different country where which is unable or unwilling to protect its own citizens, uh, and we kind of get into the whole discussion of. Uh, humanitarian interventions, uh, peacekeeping, <laughs> uh, economic sanctions. Uh, that's we we basically don't have a, a toolkit to to do that yet. So absolutely, and in fact, uh, I recently gave a paper in a conference on responsibility to protect, and why I have discreet, grave doubts about uh, the rightness of military intervention to protect human rights. But it's a very big issue. Some cosmopolitans would argue, yes, we should. Some would argue, no, for other reasons that we shouldn't. But yeah. you're absolutely right, Marcus. It's, it's, a, it's a very big hot potato, as it were, in international <laughs> law now um, about that. But one of the things that I think, since you, you kept us off course slightly, but it's all <laughs> relevant, <laughs> is, is, is that if you look at, um, if you actually look at the uh, 2005 statement from the UN on responsibility to protect, that actually um, the possibility of military intervention is only a very small part of what it's about. And most of it is about all sorts of proactive measures that can be taken internationally and um, within countries to try and create a better framework for the protection and promotion of human rights. And I think that, that as a cosmopolitan, I welcome the overall statement because it seems to me that at last the international community is recognizing that it has a much more serious responsibility to to do things than it perhaps have done in the past. Um, so, um, you know, it's, it is a hot potato, it's a, but um, I, I don't know whether we should pursue it further now, because we're kind of interested in it. I don't know how our other listeners are that grabbed by it. Um, but I wonder whether we should see if there's anything more direct to do with the ethics of aid we should return to. Yeah, I, I guess um, uh, why I thought it was relevant is uh, that you see the, uh, the connection it's it's the intentions on the one hand. Yeah. It's yeah. the uh, the the motivation, um, and but then it's also the question of okay, so do we have the tools? Are we and and that basically comes back to your third lecture. Uh, no, not just uh, it was something that came up uh, in in many parts of the lectures. Um, does what we do actually help? And that is, uh, in my, in my opinion, that's that's one of the crucial questions of ethics, that we don't just deal with principles, but we also um, bring our actions back to, or we'll, no, we we're actually we're talking about actions, not just about principles, and with the actions, we also have to see the results of the actions, and have to make sure uh, that our motives, our interests are good, but also that our actions and the results of our actions are good. And that is, I Absolutely. think, something we need to keep in mind as we're going into Haiti, as we're going uh, and work with the community. I just Absolutely. see could that... Just, oh, yes, yeah, yes. Could, could I just so add there, since uh, um, you made a very good point, which I certainly want to stress myself. Um, but I was, I was reminded that one of your deep divers fairly early on, I think she's not actually online at the moment, uh, actually um, having, having um, criticized the misuse of aid for political purposes then said, of course, we, we do have a Kantian co cosmopolitanism, which is a good thing. Uh, she was quoting Immanuel Kant. And if you remember, I mentioned the Kantian approach amongst another, a, a number of ethical approaches as being a, a good basis for cosmopolitan thinking or thinking about aid. Uh, though I didn't call it cosmopolitan then, that came in the second lecture. But what's interesting is that um, a pure Kantianism is, has got a problem. Because as if any of you did Immanuel Kant's moral philosophy ever, apart from Marcus, um, you may recall that Kant says that the only thing that's good in the world without qualification is a good will or a good intention. And many people have commented that no, good intentions are hopeless if they produce bad results. <laughs> uh, and that's sometimes a criticism made of a, a purely Kantian position, though I think there's much in Kant's approach is very good. But I think Kant, Marcus is absolutely right that you can have ever so much good intentions, but if what you do uh, is counterproductive or produces bad results, um, then clearly um, a very good reason um, 
um, not to. Uh, sorry, I think I'm just about to lose my power. Oh, we're okay. Um, so, um, uh, so the, the importance of it is 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 is, is intentions, uh, but also um, the uh, results. And that's why I said at the beginning, actually, that we may have mixed intentions or mixed motives. But so long as the mixed motives do not distort and make inappropriate the kind of aid that's given, then maybe it's it can be accepted. Um, uh, and and uh, obviously, one of the things that you're all wrestling with it in going to Haiti is that whatever interventions you have, if that's the right word, in the programs you're all going to be working on, which are different ones, I gather, um, the, the, w what you do does genuinely have a result that local people feel empowered or um, feel that they, they benefited from it rather than you're having had a good time. <laughs> yeah. Ashley posted a question in the chat and I would like to, uh, to read the, the question to you. Uh, Ashley okay. wrote, writes, in the realm of motives, I would be interested in your take on multilateral funds versus and or bilateral funds as a delivery mechanism for aid. Ah. Uh, right. The versus uh, and or was a little bit complicated when you read uh, when you read it out loud. <laughs> so it, yeah. it's it. But I mean, I, I, yeah. I, I mean, I suppose the question is whether aid this is given multilaterally, for instance, through the United Nations organization, mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> or for that matter, an EU level organization, which is multilateral as well, um, is 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 other things being equal better? than uh, aid that's given bilaterally but by one government to another government. Um, I think, I don't think there's a simple answer to this because it seems to me um, that some multilateral aid uh, may not be um, uh, successful and some bilateral aid may be successful. On the whole, I think uh, I, I, I favor the idea of multilateral aid uh, because it's less likely to have the the bias, if you like, a particular agenda of um, of a particular country behind it. Um, so, but on the other hand, I I, I wouldn't want to knock or uh, criticise too much um, uh, bilateral aid if it's if it's the right kind of aid. It seems to me the, the more crucial question um, is not who gives the aid, but what is the kind of aid that's being given. Um, um, I mean, you know, <laughs> you might say, well, a UN agency is less likely to regard appropriate aid as the provision of arms. Well, that's absolutely true, and it seems to me uh, that any bilateral aid that involves the provision of arms is it's not the kind of aid I have any interest in at all. In fact, I'm entirely opposed to it, because I think one of the main causes of the conflict in the world is the massive spread of arms of all sizes, um, and the, the arms manufacturing issue is one of the most awful ethical ones we have to yeah. face, uh, profiting from making arms which are then used to kill. Um, but then I'm a Quaker, so perhaps I would say that, but I don't think it's just because I'm a Quaker. Um, but it, it seems to me, I just did give that as an illustration that, yes, obviously, sometimes aid is totally inappropriate, and it's more likely to be inappropriate totally if it's bila uh, sorry, bilateral than if it's multilateral. Yeah. On the other hand, just because aid is given by a multilateral institution like the World Bank, doesn't mean the aid is going to be appropriate. And um, many people say a lot of the projects that the World Bank has favored have, have not been terribly successful. Um, so um, to me, the, the crucial question is, 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 is what kind of aid it is, rather than whether it's bilateral or multilateral. Now, of course, there's a, a second question. Do we favor aid given by NGOs as opposed to bilateral aid given by governments? And again, um, have to give a similar answer that sometimes NGOs will give it appropriate aid, sometimes they will not. Um, NGOs, in some ways you might say they're much smaller scale, but many of them are very big now. Um, and um, so there's a similar kind of question one can have about whether one favors government aid or whether one favors NGOs. Now, my view would be let's have as much of both as we can as long as what they're doing is appropriate. Because um, after all, I wouldn't want any argument uh, that NGOs should do the work to be a reason to, to lessen the commitment that rich countries should have, and in principle theoretically do have, to give 0.7% of GNP in aid. That goes back to the 1970s. 
and some countries get pretty close to it, other countries are fairly far off it. But it seems to me that at least that commitment should, should be there. And um, uh, if NGOs, non-governmental organizations, charities as we often call them in some countries, um, get further money from the public because the public volunteer to give more money to them, then that should be extra, not seen as uh, an alternative. So I don't know if that uh, answers the question at all, or you want to come back to me. Of course, she's, it's a, a written statement, so that should, <laughs> <laughs> I have the last word on that. <laughs> um, I, let me, uh, let me make com we, a little comment on that, uh, because especially in, in the Haiti case, um, this, this, is very, this is really a tough question. Um, we have, and then... I encourage everyone uh, talk to talk to Pedro when we're there, uh, and then talk to the community. Actually, um, there is quite a lot of uh, NGO work in Haiti, which is probably doing more harm than good. Um, yeah, yeah. That, is, like that is that is a really really difficult question in terms of multilateral aid. Um, well, probably aid is not the right word here. Um, since the mid-90s, the United Nations has had a, a very strong presence in Haiti. Um, and we had, a, two weeks ago, uh, we had a presentation from Jonathan Katz. Uh, I don't Sorry, know. I missed that. Yeah. Yeah. Jonathan, yeah. And he was, of course, uh, if you read his book or some of his articles, uh, you get the the main idea. He's very very critical of the United Nations, um, and especially uh, for uh, the failure of by on the part of the United Nations to adequately screen uh, the people who come to who came to IET, and that in effect resulted in uh, UN peacekeepers bringing cholera to IET. So yes, yes. that is. That is a very, very difficult question, um, and I would, I would totally agree with Nigel. It's not who, it's what and how, and that is, uh, that is again something uh, for us to consider. Um, and I think if we, if we bring it back during the, uh, uh, to do, during the, during our stay in Haiti, and also. Uh, when we come back from Haiti, um, bring it back basically to the third point of Honet, um, contribution to society. That's um, if if we if we really manage uh, to let uh, give the give the people in Grand Boucan and in Port-au-Prince, uh, if if we give them the voice that they contribute to their own development and they can define what how they want development what development is for them and we are the ones just basically standing back observing and then helping them um, that is probably something uh, that is that is the thing that I would like to see that is I think that is uh, in my opinion an aid that can work I mean, what I would find um, interesting after after you've all been to Haiti, and I believe there was some talk about our possibly having a follow-up discussion. Um, I'd be really interested to hear what people's impressions were, both of their own projects and whether they felt they were really helping, mm -hmm. and indeed what they saw of other projects around them. Uh, this would be really interesting. But I think what Marcus has um, has reminded us of is what I was in a way beginning to get into in the third lecture, which is, you know, what is good development for the people who want development? And one response to my third lecture might be, I don't know if anyone, you haven't had long to read it and think about it actually, but um, one response might be, well, Nigel, it's all very well going on in a high-minded way about development. It's not economic growth, uh, or only economic growth, it's all about, you know, expanding human freedoms, as Amartya Sen said, and, and so on. Uh, it's all very well saying that, but in Haiti, the, chi the primary challenge of development is precisely people want to be less poor economically. 
Um, and I think even at, I don't know what others think about this, but my feeling is that even at the level of extreme poverty, the kind that Haiti has a lot of, um, the challenge of development isn't just about making the very poor be economically a bit better off. Though that's clearly, for anyone who's very poor, an important part of the equation. But what's much more important is 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 enabling poor these very poor people in this situation to which they to get out of the traps they're in, to enable them to be more empowered, to have more skills, to have a better sense of their own, uh, playing a part in their own society, uh, and, and feeling that they're being treated as equal people. Um, this seems to me that when one's dealing with uh, or responding to extreme poverty, as you will be in Haiti, that the question, what is the kind of development we're trying to promote, is actually a very important one. Um, because it just, the question about, well, what kind of development do we want isn't just a kind of question of interest to people who are well off. It's actually a question for people at all levels of economic well-being. I hope that makes sense. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Ashley is, uh, well, she, let, me, let me go to the chat. Ashley was saying, uh, Ashley is working in global education, and they have the conversation yeah. bilateral multilateral very often so uh, she was looking for uh, some some other uh, some some different insights different input on that and Bix is writing to us uh, Bix I think you can you could also raise your question uh, yourself I was say, Blitz yeah. has been very quiet so far <laughs> <laughs> so hello have you got a call? question <laughs> So my question uh, relates to the, the idea about uh, mixed motives and um, it's... Sorry, the, the idea of... Mixed motives? Mixed motives, yeah. And um, the fact that sometimes uh, something that I, I think we may encounter, um, we heard from somebody else uh, or we will hear from somebody else about a project that they started in Haiti and then as they started the project they realized uh, that what they had set out to do was in fact not what people wanted and also not what they were truly equipped to do uh, in terms of mm -hmm. aid and uh, uh, not just financial aid but also other types of uh, development work that they were doing. Um, and I think this may be an issue that we face where we find that um, uh, the ground reality uh, may uh, impact our own motives um, for aid or what we're trying to accomplish um, and what would you suggest um, as ways to address this um, as it happens so to speak hmm um, I'll try my best but I you know I, I, having um, you, you know the proverbial um, philosopher's armchair <laughs> um, for many years I've sat in it thinking about these issues, but I have also worked in Zimbabwe but at the university, so I haven't um, sort of worked on, on on projects on the ground in quite the way you're going to do. Um, but, you know, I mean, I think, um, yes, I mean, I think what you're saying shows that, that when one's working on an aid project, one has to be extremely sensitive and willing to listen to what's happening, what people are saying they want, and if necessary, um, uh, adjust what one's doing quite significantly. I mean, I'm hoping it will not be a situation in which you all think in your projects in Haiti, gosh, what they want is so different from what we can offer, we ought to go home early. <laughs> um, I, I hope that won't happen. <laughs> um, I doubt if it will, but um, cause I think my impression is that people have thought out quite clearly what they're going to do, and certainly what I've seen people talk about seems, uh, you know, d does seem quite appropriate. Um, and health education and things like that, mm -hmm. um, but it 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 is an it is an issue um, because in a way um, I was just thinking as you were speaking. Supposing someone goes into an aid project thinking, well, what what I can do is help these um, people become economically more prosperous, and at the back of your mind is the thought, well, if they are so, then they'll be able to enter into global markets better and that's going to be better for our businesses in our part of the world and so on and I think one of the one of the kind of one of the drivers for putting so much emphasis on economic change in development isn't just 
well, we want very poor people to be less poor. Though that's that's, that's obviously a reasonable thought. Um, but they're somehow um, we want to welcome them to the modern uh, globalized world more. And that, I think, is very suspicious. Um, because it may well be that um, um, what is appropriate in terms of development, uh, enabling people to have more stable and secure lives, isn't primarily in economic terms at all. It may not be making them better consumers in the global market, but just enabling them to live more successfully in their own local communities and empowering them and so on and so forth. And I, it occurs to me as I speak that uh, although Haiti is not technically, I think, part of Latin America, is it, the Caribbean, but on the other hand, it, 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 it looks south as well as it looks north, as it were, and obviously there's been a very long tradition um, in Latin America in alternative paradigms of development which were very hostile to um, the Western paradigm. And I remember once talking to someone interested in development uh, who had met someone in Latin America um, who said to her, she was a Westerner like me, she said, you know, what we want is not to be developed by you, but liberated from you. <laughs> and I think that's quite an interesting summary of a kind of how a lot of people on the ground think about what the changes are taking place. They're very clear that it, it isn't change that's being as it were, led from the outside, but it's changed, it's led from the inside with, with a bit of help. And that may not be to make them copies of the kinds of people uh, many of us are in other parts of the world. Have, does that sort of address your question, Blitz? Yeah, it, 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 it does. Um, I think part of this is one of the questions that I didn't, uh, one of the things I wanted to mention but didn't say is, you know, what are sort of the ethical ways to uh, address um, our shifting motives once we get there? Um, yeah. And, and how to be, um, you know, what are the, the, the ethical ways to do it in a transparent way with people? Um, well, I think... That's part of what I was getting at as well. Yeah, well, maybe just to comment on that aspect more, I mean, I think, um, I'm thinking of my feet here because I've not sort of particularly thought about this precise, precise question before. Um, so I'm thinking of my feet now I'm sitting down, uh, but is, is, is that we need to um, um, be open and transparent. I mean, I, I think we should be willing to uh, not sort of bury this doubt one has about what one's doing. One should be willing to share it and then share it with those with whom one's helping. So in terms of the ethical response to a shifting motive situation, because the situation is not quite as one expected it, or one comes to realize it that what one wanted to do isn't quite what was appropriate, um, then I think one, I hope one can be as open as possible about it and be prepared to discuss it with the others and discuss it with those whom one's technically trying to, trying to help. Um, so I, I don't know if that, that's a, it's not a very profound thought, but I mean it just seems to me that openness and transparency are clearly going to be the important things here. Um, but it touches on an issue that, it was raised in, in the emails before about, you know, trying not to be superior and so on because, and I think it's very important this not to enter into age relationships um, with any attitude of, of, of personal or cultural superiority. But there is a, there is obviously a bit of a paradox at the heart of that desire, which is a very commendable desire, is that everyone knows that some people come to help others. And the very fact that some people come into Haiti to help others build community or develop the health service, whatever it might be, um, the very fact that some people come somewhere as helpers is already a difference. It's already a relationship of a helper to the helped. And all one can do is recognize that that is a fact of the dynamic, but mitigate any negative aspects of it by trying to be as utterly open and equal as possible within the constraints of a formal relationship. That, that, that is helpful. Thank you. So also, I guess part of it is also thinking about our own the, the sort of powers that we wield in these relationships as we negotiate them. So, so I'm, miss, I'm losing you. Um, the power. So, so sort of our, the power dynamics and our own yeah. positions within these relationships as we're there. I mean, you can't alter the fact there's a power dynamic from the very fact that some have come in to help others. 
um, it, it isn't. I mean, clearly, I mean, if I mean, let, I'm thinking of a contrast. Supposing uh, a scheme was arranged, and of course there are schemes like this, uh, where um, say, let's say, teenagers go and spend a week with uh, with families in another country, and the whole point of this is to enable them to be more global citizens and more respectful of other cultures and so on and so forth. And <clears throat> that, um, um, in, if, if one person goes and stays with a family somewhere else, um, then th that is on a presumpt presumption of equality. The, the basis of it is equal exchange, if you like. You have to, one person has to be staying in somebody else's house and there might be an exchange later to make it more equal. But the, the dynamics of that is quite different from the dynamics of a visit of a number of people to a country to help on projects. I mean, th there's bound to be a power dynamic there. Not an unfortunate power dynamic, but a, a dynamic nevertheless. And can I just, Marcus, I don't know how much more time we've got, but I'd just like <laughs> to mention um, um, a story. Mm -hmm. um, I remember, this is, goes back about, I don't know, what, 12 years, 14 years now. I was head of the, fairly new head of department in my university. And the dean, who's a sort of superior, superior level in, in our university system, occasionally had coffee with his heads of department and he had a chat with me about how I was getting on and he said to me, Nigel, he's just getting up to go, he said, tell me Nigel, how are you enjoying the exercise of power? <laughs> 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 and I sort of took a, a mental <laughs> gulp and thought, oh my gosh. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and I, I found myself saying, I must have been inspired at the, mo at the moment, I said, well, Graham, it's like this. There are two ways of exercising power. You can enable people to do things they might not otherwise feel able to do, or you can make people do things that they don't want to do. I've been trying to do the first. <laughs> and I think there, there's two very different views about the, the nature and exercise of power. And I think it's quite clear that people who go into a situation like this, as you're doing, are going in with certain skills they're offering and so on and so forth. And if they're exercising power, and the other side know that they're doing this because they're here to do it, they are, if they're exercising power appropriately, they are trying to empower others to do what they might, they might want to do but not otherwise feel motivated or sufficiently strong or resourced to do. Um, on the other hand, if you start finding yourself exercising power in the sense that you tell people what to do, then you've lost it. That would be the wrong exercise of power in an aid relationship. So I, I suddenly realized that story is quite relevant. <laughs> yeah, it definitely is. Uh, that <laughs> we're, we're not going to be able to escape that power dynamic. Mm -hmm. um, Haiti is used uh, over the last at least 15 years, is used to being part of an international aid economy. Yeah. Um, and uh, whether it is, uh, we're already seeing that, uh, whether it's in the context of uh, organizing the food that we're going to have or uh, getting, uh, getting no, not volunteers, but getting, we're dependent on aid from Haiti. Uh, aid, for example, in the, in the form of translators. Yeah. And they're, they're used to, um, to charging rates that um, may be appropriate or maybe not even appropriate but uh, that they get from the United Nations um, but it's something that kind of shocked us as well so, so we have this power oh, right. at the same time um, I think it's it's very relevant for us to to keep thinking about that form of exercising power that is actually something to enable people to do the things they want to but did not feel able or motivated. I mean, interestingly enough, Mar Mar Marcus, obviously in, in, in one sense, whenever we're in another country, or maybe in an aid relationship or not, we are dependent on things immediately in that country like having food and places to stay and, and so on and so forth. Um, maybe not always get our official translators, but anyway, the point is that we are we are getting services from from the local area of one kind or another, and presumably yeah, you are in this case paying for the food yeah. and paying for the accommodation and paying for the translators. So um, there is that kind of dynamic, but perhaps 
uh, I suppose I wanted to turn the question around and say, well, in a way, is it a good thing that you're having to depend on them for food accommodation and translators, etc.? Because that, in a sense, is a way of saying, look, it's not a total one-way relationship. Um, although, as I said, it doesn't alter the fact that the dynamic is you're, you've come into the country to do something to help them. Um, and and that, that's a fundamental fact of the aid relationship, however much one tries to, as it were, treat it in as equal a way as possible. Um, but the fact that uh, you're clearly dependent at a price obviously higher than you'd hope for <laughs> your translators, um, that, that, um, uh, that in a way is a nice reminder that there are power relationships both ways. Yeah. And that's a good thing in a way, isn't it? It shows, uh, <laughs> it, it complicates, it, it makes things very, very complex, very complicated, uh, because just as uh, we don't want to uh, go in there and exercise power, tell them what to do and how to develop in which direction, uh, and in that form abuse the power that we have, uh, we also don't want to work together with people, with local people who uh, kind of ab want to abuse uh, the their power relationship, just the, uh, in in the other direction. Uh, so mm -hmm. so it's it's kind of walking a tightrope uh, because we want a cooperative relationship. And I guess yeah. uh, it serves as a as a very valuable reminder to us. Uh, getting that that reaction back uh, that uh, how how difficult it will al always be for us to mm -hmm. uh, to 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 keep up that cooperate cooperative or uh, to to develop in the first place mm -hmm. a cooperative relationship. And so, uh, and, yeah. and part of the things uh, that we're trying to do, and uh, Ashley, Christina, Big, Snyder, uh, Johanna, you will uh, you will see it is uh, that uh, the community will prepare food for all of us, and, and so we have the, the common meals, and it's it's and it's it's also um, yeah. So so we're trying to to do something there, but it it really is. Is a helpful way to think about it. How how difficult mm -hmm. it is. And I, and I suppose one aspect of the difficulty is is this that um, I, I don't know about Haiti society in detail, but I imagine that the the power dynamics between men and women is not quite what we have in other countries, and there may be issues therefore mm -hmm. that if you're working with people in local organisations, that you will see power dynamics between men and women which are not quite how you feel they should be. Yeah. Um, and, and then that it raises the whole issue about respect for cultural difference. How far do you just accept? Well, that's what we're working with. We just don't accept that we think sometimes men may have it over women in a way we wouldn't think was acceptable in another society. Um, or how far does one try and you know, gently pressure for change? Yeah. I, mean, I, 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 I don't know whether this is an issue that you've, you've been grappling with, but I imagine it could be an issue. It's definitely something we need to keep our eyes open. Yep, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Johanna says, we'll find out. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Um, Nigel, you've anyway, been... I'm, I'm going to have to yes. go fairly soon. Yes, uh, um, I was just yeah. going to say, uh, you've been with us for, for an hour already. Yeah, um, well, that's been great. <laughs> I'm, I'm happy to hear that. Um, I wanted to ask for one last round of questions. Yep, right, good. That sounds like a quick round. <laughs> <laughs> no, seriously, uh, I'm very happy to. <laughs> yeah. Okay. I'm well, sure as a good chairman, Mark, Mark <laughs> you have a reserve question. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, maybe just... Uh, we've talked about the, the community engagement and um, coming there with questions instead of answers and uh, uh, showing our appreciation basically to um, yeah. to the community by 
not going there with uh, with ready answers, but uh, with with an open mind, with open uh, with questions, and then with a willingness uh, to help them uh, realize the kind of development uh, that they want to do. Mm -hmm. um, I think that um, what you the, the the strong emphasis you you put on Amartya Sen uh, and the the capabilities approach is yeah, something that yeah. was very helpful um, for us to to think about what we want to do uh, because it also uh, it deals with okay the capabilities basically you you need to ask the people first okay what are the capabilities you want to develop um, I'm really breaking it down to, to very small pieces, I know. Um, yeah. But what, uh, is there some good advice from either Amartya Sen or from Nigel Dower um, <laughs> that you would like to, to, to leave us with? Okay, how, how should you, how should we approach our stay in Haiti? How can we increase the chances that we'll take, uh, that we will actually do what we want to do, that we take seriously what we say about um, being open and, and helping the community develop as they want. Okay. Um, I was going to attempt to say I, I can speak more authoritatively about what I send about Nigel Dower. <laughs> <laughs> But uh, no, um, seriously, I think um, I think the important point to make about Amartya Sen, which perhaps I didn't stress as fully as I might, but it's implied, mm -hmm. is that one of the main reasons he sees himself as opposed to utilitarianism, the, the idea that we go out and do good to cre create the best balance of good over bad in the world, is that utilitarian tends to understand goodness in terms of preference satisfaction or satisfying one's desires. And for Marta Sen, this is far too passive a model, mm -hmm. a passive model of what human well-being consists in. And the main thing that Marta Sen is pushing, apart from all the detail, is that um, humans are agents. It's an agency approach um, in the sense that humans are primarily agents who make decisions that affect their own lives. So um, the main thing one needs to bear in mind all the time in, in, in what you're doing, both when you reflect and when you're engaged in what you're doing, is that you, you're not seeing the people whom you're, quotes, helping as passive recipients of well-being that you're giving them, as opposed to active makers of their own uh, future, if you like, um, make, making choices about what directions they want to take and so on. So the key point, um, I think, general point is the idea of keeping very mind all the time, all human beings, even the very poor, are, are agents first mm -hmm. and foremost. And one of the main, of course, points about, I, I, I think I mentioned it in passing somewhere in the lecture, is one of the things that makes um, poverty particularly um, d d a bad thing. It's not just the fact that people are ill or diseased or hungry or whatever. Um, it, it's, well, that's obviously the outward manifestation of it is the fact that poor people are disempowered. Mm. By disempowered, I mean they, they lack, they don't have proper power or control of their lives. But they are, uh, um, you know, perfectly capable of control of their lives, given half a chance. Yeah. So it's, it, it's creating the conditions in which people themselves feel, not only objectively, but subjectively feel more confidence that they can make their own decisions that affect their own lives. And so your primary role all the time is one of enabling, rather than, say, providing um, something. Not so much providing a good or service, though you're doing that. Obviously, that's why you're there in a way. But always trying to see, how can I enable this person or this group of people um, make more decisions that affect their lives for the, for the better? Um, and so it's, it's the perspective of agency, that I think, is one of the things that's important in more important in Sen's writings than that of some others like Martha Nussbaum, but although she wouldn't deny it, but Sen makes a lot of, of the point um, of, of agency. Um, and so, as you said, Marcus, the crucial question is, you know, 
what are the capabilities that they want to develop. Um, uh, and bear in mind, of course, that the capabilities that people have are in part a function of how they were educated. It goes back to their childhood and younger years. Um, and um, to some extent, what we may be doing is providing them with the skills that education produced um, if they didn't have them at the earlier stage. Um, but of course, the other part of capabilities is not um, not just having those skills and knowledge sets and so on that education gives, but also um, uh, having the, if you like, social and political space in which to exercise them. And I don't know how far, um, I mean, Haiti is a, is a democracy, but um, there are democracies and democracies. And I just, I just don't know how far in practice um, ordinary people feel empowered to voice their criticisms of what bureaucracies do and, they, and government officials do and so on. Because that's one of the things that's one of those cheap impediments to people doing what they want with their lives because they, they frankly have fear. And the lack of fear is one of the things that is one of the, one of the most enabling things one can, can work on. Um, because if you have a, a social, economic, social political framework and respect to law and so on, which enables people to have freedoms to do things together, to, to, to pursue those kind of projects, without a fear that the police are going to come up and round them up and so on, and that is a very important enabling condition in which people can exercise whatever capabilities they may have acquired through education and other means. So there are many dimensions to the framework which enable people to fully exercise their capabilities. They need them, and that to do with education and so on, but they also need an enabling framework of law and culture which gives them the freedom and space in which they exercise their freedom and confidence. And so whatever you can do to kind of encourage them to, to take control and control their lives in that way, I think will be for the good. Yeah. That's a, a bit rambling answer, but I hope you <laughs> some of the points. <laughs> no, but I think that is a, is a wonderful parting thought for us. Mm -hmm. uh, keep in mind the, the agency of the people we're dealing with, of our treating them as partners on the ground, not as yeah. recipients, yeah. Uh, taking seriously what they are telling us, uh, but at the same time, and I think that is uh, that is a very important point for us to keep in mind, um, the situation we encounter may not be a situation where they really like to share with us all their doubts, yeah. fears, uh, desires, uh, but that's a situation that we have to start creating, or I we have to start creating that situation first. And I think you're right, Mark, because I think one of the things you're going to have to do, and it's going to be difficult to do it in just a week, yeah. is build in them a sufficient confidence that they're, you're not going to spill the beans or say things they wouldn't like other people to hear. Yeah. So kind of, if you like, Chatham House rules or confidentiality conditions need to be established very clearly early on if you're going to get them to say much. Mm -hmm. And again, you see, I, and that the, the leaders may say things, but will... How much will the ordinary people say? And that's another dynamic, of course. What leaders say is not necessarily what the people they're leading say. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> there, are authority, yeah. there are authority issues within the social communities you're going to be working with. <laughs> not just the men, not just the men women issue, but the leader uh, and the others issue. Yeah. So all kinds of things we need to keep in mind. <laughs> um, but uh, with that, we're going to have a. a Definitely a very interesting, hopefully also a very successful week. Um, I wanted to mm -hmm. thank Nigel again uh, for taking the time today, for being with us, uh, and giving us these, uh, a, a framework of, of thought, actually. Uh, I think that is, that is one of the most important functions of ethics, helping us to clearly think about what we're mm -hmm. doing, why we're doing, and whether we actually achieve what we want to do, um, and then also bring it together with uh, very practical considerations. Nigel, it was, as always, a pleasure to have you with us. Uh, thanks so much for that. And we will make sure that you will also hear from our experience on the ground um, so that you see uh, to what degree we've been able to take your, or your suggestions and your 
um, their input seriously.